good afternoon and welcome to NASA's Johnson Space Center. I'm Courtney Beasley and I am joined by NASA astronaut Frank Rubio. We will be taking questions from here in the room on our phone bridge and through social media using the hashtag AskNASA. Frank, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, Courtney, thanks so much and uh, thanks everybody for being here. It's great to finally uh, put some faces to names. I've been staring at a camera for 12 months, so it's uh, great to be here. Well, we sure are happy to have you home. There's a lot of people here who are ready to ask questions. For media in the room, please state your name and affiliation when called on. We'll go ahead and start here in the room. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm Mark Corot with Aviation Week and Space Technology. And, and I'm wondering, based on your flight experience recently and your professional background as a medical doctor and a flight surgeon, if you have some thoughts about how you and colleagues in the future returning from missions as long as yours or longer, um, how they're going to fare when they get back to Earth. Are they going to be able to climb out and be okay on the, on the Earth? Thank you. Yeah, hey, uh, Mark, good afternoon. Uh, nice, nice to see you. And, um, you know, honestly, uh, it's such a uh, varied response, right? And it just a lot of it depends on um, how much work you put on in station as far as your fitness level, but really a lot of it's dictated by genetics, uh, your size, your weight. Um, and so it's, there's so much variability in it that it's really hard to say blanket statement, hey, yeah, we'll all be good uh, or not. I mean, even with a crew of three and all of us having worked very similarly up there, uh, you saw very different responses when we first came out of the capsule. Um, and so I think for the most part, within 24 hours, everyone's feeling really uh, pretty good. Uh, but within the first eight hours, there's quite a varied response. So it's just going to depend individual to individual. As, as, as you begin to, to go through the routines that you had on life on Earth before you did your missions, can you bounce back and sort of... Yeah, I mean, again, so I can only speak to my experience, and uh, I've been very pleasantly pleased. I honestly had a lot of curiosity myself, uh, just medical curiosity as to how my body was going to respond. And um, within a week, I actually felt very normal. Uh, within three days, all the vertigo was gone. Um, you know, there's a little bit of vertigo when you first land, and for the first couple days, you kind of veer to the right or to the left as you're trying to walk straight. Um, and. Uh, your mind is perfectly clear, but your body's just not quite responding the way you expect it to. Uh, but within about 72 hours, that all cleared up, and I felt like I was uh, really pretty at a pretty high functional level. But again, that's that's kind of my response, and so that's really all I can speak to. Gina, go ahead. Uh, Gina Sinceri, ABC News. Your mission, you know, in space is over, but down on Earth, the research continues. And I remember Scott Kelly had talked after his mission about his eyesight. You know, you talked a little bit to Mark's question about how your body changed. Did your eyesight change? And how long does the research on what this did to your body last? I mean, we're talking years now. Yeah, so we, we do have an incredibly robust uh, research program here at NASA. And uh, you do feel a little bit like a guinea pig when you first get back, but in, in a good way, right? Like, uh, there's just so few of us. And so for anything that has to do with medicine, you just need uh, lots of numbers to have the proper power for a study to to, to be able to generalize statements like saying, hey, this is how the population is going to respond. And again, we're a pretty unique population anyways. So um, as far as my eyesight, honestly, I was pleasantly surprised. Um, I actually, the, the glasses that I was uh, most recently using on station, I found that they were too strong when I got back. Um, I, I did not experience any long-term uh, detrimental effects that I can tell. Again, they'll, they'll be studying me for the, the rest of my life, more than likely. Uh, but my, my eyesight seems to have gotten a little bit better since I returned. Uh, I think some of that has to do with, um, again, there's several different factors playing into it. For mine, uh, you know, where it's somewhat age-related changes that I experience, it just so happens that I'm hitting that point where I'm needing uh, readers in life. Um, I think the fluid shifts that happen in space affect your lens a little bit, um, and, and in just a mechanical way, not necessarily in a uh, neuro-optic uh, way. And so when that fluid shift uh, drops, as you can probably tell, my face is just a little less puffy uh, a couple of weeks later. I think that pressure that it applies to the lens and the slight uh, change in the shape that it provides, um, it goes away. And so your eyesight uh, gets a little better, at least for me it has. Go ahead. Uh, Tim Kort from Polish Public Television. Uh, Frank, 
you answered the question a little bit, but I want to be, uh, to be concrete. What was the biggest challenge after you came back to Earth? Uh, it was first walk or uh, keeping a phone on your hand or <laughs> something like that. Yeah. Second question, uh, what was your first thought when you heard that your mission will be longer? Sure, yeah, so uh, for the first part of your question, um, honestly, I, I felt really um, lucky in the sense that there was almost an on-off switch for me in that uh, there was not a whole lot of confusion between space and Earth. Uh, pretty much as soon as I landed, I think my body understood that I was back on Earth. And so there was never anything of like expecting something to float uh, or dropping something when I didn't. Um, now, I did try to throw things in the trash a couple times, and it landed short. And that's just because it uh, turns out gravity is, uh, has quite the effect. So, um, But other than that, I didn't really drop anything. Um, and so I will say that uh, walking just hurts a little bit the first uh, few days, the bottom of your feet and your lower back, because they're, uh, again, although I may maintain my strength, I think there's just a certain level of soreness that comes with the fact that your lower back is now bearing half your weight. And same thing for your feet. You know, the tops of my feet I've been using to, to hook onto uh, handrails for the past year, and all of a sudden they're, they're carrying my entire weight. Uh, so they were sore. They weren't pain. Uh, there wasn't any pain, but they were just kind of sore at the end of the day. Uh, and as far as, gosh, what I felt, you know, such mixed emotions, and it really happened over uh, several days and weeks as far as the decision that we were going to stay longer. Uh, so there was a lot of time to process. Uh, at first, there was a lot of hope that, you know, we would be extended for just a little bit of time, not, not the full six months. Um, and, and there was that chance kind of persisted for about a month or so after the incident happened, uh, if not a little longer. Uh, and so you kind of held out hope that, hey, maybe we'll go uh, home at seven month or nine month mark. Uh, so really by the time the decision was made by, to say, hey, we're going to stay the full 12 months, you were kind of mentally prepared. So um, I think it was not nearly as tough as it would have been had the decision been made immediately after the incident happened. Okay, our next question comes from Jane on X, and she wants to know, what will you miss most about life on orbit? Oh, uh, you know, it's a really, it's a close, uh, close tie. Um, so, well, actually three things. So my crewmates, you know, uh, but I know I'm going to see them here again, uh, but I, I really, especially um, my last crew, essentially two, two, two classmates, uh, you know, I had a couple weeks with them and uh, I miss hanging out with them, um, but I know they'll be back soon. So uh, the views are, are probably uh, easily number one. Uh, I mean, it's just such a spe spectacular and unique view uh, when you look down at the Earth. Uh, that, and the fact that you can just float over, you know, even if you're having a hard day uh, or you're in the middle of something and you just go and look out the window for 10 or 20 seconds, it just kind of lifts your spirits up. So I think uh, that'll be um, something I miss tremendously. And then, um, you know, floating is just a lot of fun. Honestly, you feel like a little kid, right? Uh, it, is, it does provide a difficult work environment because it turns out holding things down while you're trying to work on them, it just, it's a different challenge. Uh, but it's just such a, uh, again, you, you feel like a 10-year-old kid uh, when you're doing, you get to do it uh, at, for as long as you're up there. So I think those two things are probably what I'm gonna miss the most. And walking seems much more exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It takes a lot longer to get from point A to point B. Yep. Yeah. We have another question here in the room. Hi, Sophie Sanchez with Cosmic Chicago. Um, we've had recent news of a third leak this year on station. Um, I was wondering if I can get your thoughts on that. And then based on your experience, can you share a little bit about what your um, astronaut colleagues still on station might be dealing with, any specific tasks that they might be doing, or any that you had to um, perform while you were on station also dealing with leaks? Yeah, hey Sophie. Um, yeah, you know, I have, um, unfortunately I don't have a whole lot of details about the most recent and uh, third incident. So I really can't speak too well to that um, as far as what we think was the cause of that, if it was similar to the, um, the cause of the initial two um, incidents that we had w while we were in space. Um, if they do happen to be related, and I don't know if they are or not, uh, obviously it, it speaks of maybe there's a change in the environment, uh, right, for them to happen this relatively close together. Um, but I, I'm fully confident that the, the ground team uh, the engineering team is doing an incredible amount of analysis uh, to kind of get to the root cause. And uh, like they did for us, they're going to come up with a great plan to make sure that the you know, crew safety is paramount to everybody on the team. And, uh, and that just overrides everything. And so when you're up there and you're, even though you're living it and you're part of it, uh, there's a great deal of confidence that uh, you know, 
hundreds if not thousands of people are working uh, day and night to keep you safe. And so that gives you just a lot of comfort and uh, confidence. Okay, our next question is from the phone bridge from Andrea with the Houston Chronicle. Welcome back. Um, my question is actually a follow-up on what you just answered. Um, uh, obviously, the, the leak, um, the leak uh, postponed two spacewalks, and you know the first coolant leak um, affected you at home. And so I'm just curious. You know, NASA and Russia are partners in space, um, but how do all these issues with Russian hardware affect NASA and its ability to come out of the mission? And then um, my second question is just, other than seeing your family, what did you do first when you came back to Houston? Thank you. Hey, Andrea, I am so sorry, but you came in uh, somewhat broken, uh, Courtney. Do you yeah, know? Andrea, can you try to repeat your question, please? You're coming in a little warbled. Uh, sorry, is this any better? A little bit. Okay, um, that might be my cell connection. Um, <clears throat> I just, following up on the question about the hardware issues with Ross Cosmos, how did these um, affect NASA's ability to complete their missions? Obviously, you didn't get home um, when you expected, and now two spacewalks have been postponed. So I was interested in your perspective on that, if that came through better. Yeah, it did. Uh, thanks, Andrea. Well, you know, honestly, um, again, that, that decision-making ma process is, is above my level, and um, there's just so much input and data that's being weighed uh, that it would be really hard for me to say, um, you know, one way or the other. But I will say again, I am incredibly confident in our leadership team and our engineering team uh, that they're going to um, try as much as possible to get to the root cause and then mitigate uh, in whatever way possible to make sure that we have a safe working environment and that we can continue the mission, right? I mean, nobody's more interested than NASA in continuing this mission. I mean, we have 23 years invested into this. And so I can assure you that everybody's uh, doing their absolute best to make sure that uh, the space station is both safe and that we can continue the mission as long as um, we're supposed to. So um, yeah, and I think it is, um, that is applicable not just to us, but to all of our international partners. We'll take another phone bridge question from Elizabeth with space.com. Hi, uh, thanks for uh, taking the time and welcome home. Um, I was curious about what you found were some of the benefits or good things about doubling your time in space. Were you able to, for example, complete any experiments that you had started or take part in any extra activities? Thank you. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, um, there were some benefits for sure. Again, uh, this was an uh, incredibly challenging experience on a personal level. Uh, but professionally, like anything, right, I think we're always uh, trying to improve. And the, the reality is I learned a lot those first six months. Um, you know, especially as, as the USOS lead, I was able to kind of uh, do some self-assessment and see what thing, things I had done well, what things I had done poorly, and try to improve on those for the next uh, half of the expedition or for the next expedition. And um, the reality is I, I'm incredibly lucky in the fact that you're able to l take those lessons learned and immediately implement them, right? Because a lot of people have to wait five, six, ten years until they are able to implement those things that they, they just learned. And so from that uh, perspective, I counted myself pretty lucky in that um, I was Im immediately able to, to self-assess and then try to improve myself. Uh, and then like anything, I think anything we do in life, the second or third time that you do it, you're just more efficient at it because you're familiar with it. Uh, you know the little tricks of the trade on how to do it. Uh, and I think that applies to any job th that a human being does. And so it absolutely applied to, to what I did up there. Um, again, not that I was perfect by any means. I still made way more mistakes than I would uh, care to admit. Uh, but I think I was much more efficient for the second six uh, months than I was for the first six months. Okay, our next question comes from Brady on X. And he asks, how long did it take to adjust to sleeping in zero G and then readjusting back on Earth? Yeah, no, I, you know, again, I count myself incredibly blessed in that. Um, the first night in space was really pretty weird. And I remember waking up and just uh, you're just a little uh, discombobulated, for lack of a better word, because you're not just disoriented, but you, you kind of forget where you are. Uh, there's no pressure on your back. Uh, and you're, you're in your sleeping bag. So it's just kind of very disorienting. Um, but then by day two, my, my brain just kind of understood where I was. And uh, I was incredibly comfortable and slept great, uh, and then really slept really well for the full 12 months. And then uh, same thing upon return. I just thought having all that pressure on my skin, especially, was going to be really challenging. And um, I was jet lagged, so there was a little bit of that in the play. But after the first three days or so when the jet lag wore off, I found that I've been sleeping pretty well. 
Okay, we'll take a question here. With Univision, I'm going to do my questions in Spanish. Yeah. Primero que nada, muchas felicidades por estos logros. ¿Qué se siente ser un astronauta estadounidense que está haciendo historia, pero además también como el primer latinoamericano en cumplir esta hazaña? Y mi segunda pregunta, cuando se supo que se iba a extender el tiempo en el espacio, ¿qué sintió, qué pasó por su mente y qué fue lo más difícil en ese momento? Sí, bueno, eh, buenas tardes, Merlin, y eh, mucho gusto. Eh, bueno, eh, como siempre, es un gran orgullo, no, no solo a representar eh, nuestro país, pero nuestra comunidad. Y uh, para mí es un gran orgullo, un honor. Uh, y como siempre he dicho, espero que hay, uh, soy uno de los primeros, pero uh, si Dios quiere, no, no los últimos eh, hispanos que vamos a seguir haciendo parte de la historia de este gran país. Um, y bueno, eh, de veras que como un... Um, tengo la suerte de tener mucha experiencia militar. Uh, y para eso uno sabe que tiene una misión y tiene un trabajo que hacer. Y aunque es difícil, uno se enfoca en, en, el, en la misión. Entonces, uh, claro, que fue difícil saber que iba a uh, tener seis meses más que iba a perder con mi familia. Uh, pero al fin del día, uh, tengo muchos compañeros en el ejército que, que se han extendido en la guerra, donde sea. Y, y por eso es difícil sentirse uh, Sorry for yourself. Uh, no, entonces, uh, uh, es de enfocarse en la misión y decir, uh, hacer la decisión que lo voy a hacer con la mejor actitud que es posible y hacer el mejor trabajo que puedo. Yeah. Okay, we'll take a question from the phone bridge from Jackie with the Times of London. Hello, can you hear me okay? We can hear you. Marvelous. Thank you very much, and welcome back to Earth. I'm interested in the psychological aspect of what happens when you're told that you're going to actually be spending a year in space and almost twice as long as you'd expected. Um, I wondered if you could talk about your relationship with the tomato plant, the tomato, tomato. Um, anyone who's seen The Martian knows what psychological boost you can get from, you know, seeing life up there with you. But Can you talk us through that, how something like watching a plant grow in space keeps you somehow connected to life on Earth? And also a little of that psychological and personal aspect. You said it, there were some personal challenges, and we don't see those family impacts and the behind-the-scenes adjustments you have to make uh, when your mission is extended. Um, could you just talk us through some of that and give us some insight? Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, Jackie, good evening. I think uh, your time in, in London, and uh, thanks for the questions. Uh, so I answered a little bit of that in Spanish, but um, certainly I'll answer it again in English. Um, you know, every individual obviously is very different, right? And so I think we'll all handle it very differently. For me, uh, again, to some degree, I was lucky in uh, my military background. Uh, you know, I've had missions extended. I've had plenty of friends and family that have been uh, under much more duress and much more difficult conditions who've been extended. Um, and so, again, it was it was somewhat difficult to feel sorry for myself in that situation. Uh, that's not to say we didn't have a couple of hard days. We absolutely did as a family uh, when we came to grips with the fact that, um, hey, we're, we're going to have to do this for another six months uh, more than we expected. Um, but uh, you know, it helped tremendously to have an incredible community around us. And I knew that my family was, um, not only were they showing a lot of resilience and strength, but the community around us was just uh, Gosh, they, they, they just did so much, you know, so much prayer, support. Uh, it was really almost overwhelming how much uh, love and support we received. And so from that perspective, it made it incredibly uh, easy. Um, and yeah, you know, you just have to, at least for me, you have to make a conscious decision to say, hey, this is the mission. I got to focus on that. Uh, you know, I, I kind of allowed myself a day to feel sad and sorry for myself. And then I, I try to really make a conscious decision to say, okay, let's, let's have a good attitude and let's just try to Uh, do the best job possible uh, that I can. Now, um, I had a lot of personal motivation. I have two kids that are in college uh, that are, uh, were, at the time, undergoing very challenging experiences themselves uh, because of where they're going to school. And those, that first year there is uh, incredibly challenging. And so it was also important to me to set a good example for them. Right? We, we talked so much as they were growing up about, hey, we do hard things. Uh, we do hard things with a good attitude. And so um, I think I would have been selling myself and them short if I hadn't handled this the way that we did. And so for my wife and I both, I think that was a really important uh, part of the, um, the way we handled it. Uh, but I think overall, the uh, love and support we received made it way, way easier uh, than uh, I think people might expect. Okay. 
from AFP. Bienvenido de vuelta. For the human part, what do you miss the most when you were on the space and the, the professional part? How do you think this extended mission you had is laying the groundwork for deep space exploration? Thank you. Bueno, muchas gracias, Moses. Um, bueno, eh, well, so what did I miss the most? You know, my, my family obviously is is always, uh, and that is it's not just because I know that's the right answer. Like, I genuinely love uh, spending time with my kids and my wife, and so uh, I miss that. Um, I love the outdoors, and so you know I, I try to go out and hike, mountain bike, ski uh, at least several times a year. And so the fact that I was going to go a full year kind of locked inside uh, was kind of torture for me uh, because I, I love being outside. And so, uh, but again, that was the mission. Uh, it's hard to say being in space is torture, uh, but um, you know it, it took a little bit of uh, mental shift to know like, hey. This is this is my world for the next 12 months, and I just gotta uh, deal with it. And so um, that is both one of the bigger challenges, and also the thing that I missed the most was just being outside and being able to walk outside whenever I wanted to. Um, and I'm sorry for the professional question. Say, uh, uh, is it, uh, how do you think this extended mission you had is uh, laying the world for the deep space exploration? Yeah, you know, I, I think it's um, obviously every data point is super important. Again, it's, it's really difficult to say because, um, you know, say in 10 or 20 years when we're trying to go to Mars, right, it's not going to be me. And so the data that we're getting from me now is, is for me individually. You can generalize that a little bit, but not completely because uh, for human beings and medical response, you, you just can't do that. Uh, and so, but the more people that we have that go to the year-long mission, you know, so we've had Mark, Christina, Scott, uh, and there's been several cosmonauts who've been up there this long. And so all that data, I think, is incredibly valuable to, to tell us, hey, more than likely, this is how we're going to respond. Uh, the one thing that I think is really hard to measure is um, you know, when you're doing a lunar mission, when you're doing a Mars mission, there is an, a certain amount of motivation that you just can't quantify. Right? Uh, ultimately, those of us who do this job, like, we're incredibly motivated uh, to not just explore, but to do the best that we can, because uh, we, we realize we represent our NASA, our nation, and humanity. And so um, I think that motivation is really hard to quantify. And, um, and it's also going to be way more powerful than we probably give it credit for. So uh, I think whoever ends up doing those missions, uh, they're going to make it happen, because that, that's just kind of what we do. Mark. Yes, thanks. Uh, Mark Caro with uh, Aviation Week. Thanks for the second question. Do you see yourself launching into space again? Hey, Mark, sorry about that. Uh, just got told my mic was. Um, I, I hope so. Yeah, you know, it, again, it's going to depend a little bit. Um, well, a lot of it on my family, right, and what they weigh in on, um, because this was, was challenging. Um, but I, I think, you know, a, a couple years down the road, we'll definitely be in a better spot to kind of reassess for our family how, how that works. Um, some of that is going to depend on my body, whether physically I'm still able to meet all the requirements that I need to meet to, to continue to do uh, human spaceflight. And then, uh, of course, the biggest portion is going to depend on NASA, right, if, uh, how, how they see me contributing to the mission. But um, if I'm not flying myself, I hope to be at least helping my uh, crewmates, my buddies, uh, get out there and do incredible things in space. Okay, our next question comes from the phone bridge from Marsha with Space Policy Online. Uh, thanks so much. This is Marcia Smith with SpacePolicyOnline.com. I'm wondering, from a medical perspective at least, is there anything that you can say about what qualities or characteristics NASA should go, or anyone should be looking for when they're choosing the crews to go on these much longer duration missions? You've talked about how you're a very small group of people who have been up there for a year or so, and each one of you reacts differently to it. Are, are there any commonalities, or you know, as a medical person yourself, what would you tell the folks who are choosing the astronauts who are going to go for you know two years or three years to Mars? Yeah, hey, Marsha, um, that's a great question. And honestly, the one thing I can speak to on that is um, what we saw, what I saw for the last 12 months is how important uh, team dynamics and teamwork uh, really is to, to making the mission not just happen, but happen uh, successfully and happen really well. And that's just not, not just for the... Uh, seven or 11 people who are up there um, at any given time, really that applies to the ground team too, because most of the team that makes up this incredible mission is, is on the ground. 
Uh, so that's the flight directors, the flight controllers, uh, all the science uh, people who, who make everything happen, uh, and really just the ground support. I mean, we have hundreds uh, and thousands of people throughout the world who support this mission. Um, and it all kind of just melds in this incredible way to make this thing happen. But um, obviously, the, the crew that's out there together uh, for an exp expended, uh, extended period of time, uh, I think the, the better you work as a crew, the, the smoother it tends to go. And again, I was um, super blessed to have really good crewmates. And um, I don't know that I could have asked for better crewmates for, for the uh, 12 months that I was there. And so uh, the one thing I walked away with is how incredibly important that was, not just psychologically, but also just to making, making things happen. Because um, you know, if I was struggling with something, my crewmates would jump in and help me out. If, if, I, if they were struggling, uh, we would just help each other out to make things happen. And I know that happens in lots of places throughout the world. Uh, but in that unique setting, I think being able to not just help each other out, but you know, again, it wasn't like a magic, magical kumbaya for 12 months. Uh, there were challenges. Uh, but we were able to come together as a crew and say, hey, here's the issue I'm having, or here's the issue you're having. Let's work it out. And without fail, we worked them out. And we always came out better. And were a, a better functioning team after, after we went through those problems. So. Gina, go ahead. Uh, Gina Sinceri, ABC News. What did your mom say when you got back, and what was the reaction in El Salvador when you returned? What did you hear from the community down there? Hey, Gina. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, obviously she was, she was incredibly happy that I was uh, back safely. Um, gosh, you know, I, I've, I've been amazed, both my mom, my wife, and my kids, uh, the resilience they've shown, especially uh, my mom and my wife throughout my life. Um, I've, I've done a lot of things that a lot of people would probably freak out over, right? Not just doing themselves, but like your loved one, uh, especially my mom, I think, because now that I have kids, I'm like, hey, it's okay if I do the dangerous things. Maybe it's not okay if you do them, <laughs> you know? Um, but um, the, the support and the faith that they've shown throughout, you know, whether we're skydiving or flying or going to combat um, or getting on a rocket or doing a spacewalk, um, they either fake it really well or they, they do just an incredible job of trusting and having faith that it's going to go OK. Uh, and so I've never had any trepidation from their side, which has he uh, helped me uh, tremendously, right? Because uh, I'm not the type that, that um, dwells too long on the risk. I, obviously, we, we, we do a, an incredible job of assessing the risk and managing the risk and making sure that we have every mitigation possible. But then I don't spend a lot of time, um, I guess, fearfully thinking about it. Right? You just kind of assess it, and you do what you need to do to mitigate that risk. Uh, and so knowing that they're able to uh, handle it well also helps me kind of focus on that. So, and then, yeah, you know, the support that I've had from the Salvadoran community has just been incredible. Um, I, you know, the, the country has had, uh, unfortunately, a, a tough history. A lot of things that it's known for aren't necessarily uh, great. But they're great people, and they're incredibly kind, hardworking, uh, good people, right, the vast majority. And so I, I feel really fortunate that I'm able to kind of represent uh, the country and that community and the people in a good way, uh, and hopefully start turning the tide towards when, when people hear El Salvador, they think of really positive things, because really the vast majority of the people from that country, that's, that's what they represent. Yes, hello. I wanted to know uh, about the tomatoes you try to <laughs> oh, yeah. grow. Back, back to the tomato. Yeah, OK. So I, I think people have heard that story. Um, so um, we, we were growing tomato, tomatoes to try to uh, figure out, hey, uh, again, as we approach longer term missions, we need to be able to grow our food and sustain. And it's really important to have fresh food. And so um, we were growing some of the first tomatoes. I harvested, I think, what was the first tomato in space. Uh, and I put it in a little bag. and. One of my crewmates was doing a, um, a PAO event with some school kids, and I thought it would be kind of cool to show the kids, hey, guys, this is the first uh, tomato harvested in space. Uh, and then I was pretty confident that I Velcroed it where I was supposed to Velcro it, and then I came back, and it was gone. And I mean, I spent probably 8 to 20 hours of my own time looking for that tomato. Uh, and an, unfortunately, you know, um, because that's just human nature, a lot of people are like, he probably ate the tomato. <laughs> uh, and you know, I, I wanted to find it mostly so I could prove like I did not eat the tomato. So I never found it. Um, the reality is that probably you know the humidity up there is 17%, and so we're probably desiccated to the point where you couldn't tell what it was, and somebody just threw away the bag thinking it was trash. 
Uh, and so a, a proud moment of harvesting the first tomato in space became a, a self-inflicted uh, wound of like losing the first tomato in space. But um, hopefully somebody will find it someday, you know, some little shriveled thing in a, in a uh, Ziploc bag, and they can, uh, they can prove the fact that I did not eat the tomato <laughs> in space. Maybe, maybe still a lot of people thinking you ate it. But Yeah, I know, I know. Uh, only time will tell. But anyways, yeah, I'm confident that I did not. But it, it is a, a point of pride that I, I lost it like a lack of point of pride, uh, so. <laughs> Mistakes happen in yeah, space, too. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so Joanne Napping for Polish Public Television, if we have a second round, uh, maybe you will have a second chance and grow potato on Mars, <laughs> yeah. like Matt Damon. You know. Yeah, that's right. But it's not my question. Yeah. <laughs> the question is, you said that uh, you missed the outdoors uh, because you like activities outdoors, but is it tricky because you had more space when you have uh, your uh, spacewalks? And is it, c can you somehow uh, said it is uh, a little bit like on Earth or is completely different? Because I haven't been to space. Yeah, yeah, no, it, gosh, and I do wish everybody could go to space for a day because uh, it really, um, it does so many things. One, it makes you appreciate what we're capable as, as humanity, right? When we put our um, joint efforts towards something good, we're, we're, we're capable of incredibly good things uh, and incredibly amazing things. And so that, that to me is uh, just such a cool thing to not just experience, but appreciate while you're up there. Um, it makes you appreciate how unique our planet is and how thin our atmosphere really is and, and how little is protecting us from the vastness of nothingness that's out there as far as vacuum. And just it's an environment that has zero forgiveness, right? Like uh, I think that's hard to really explain uh, to people is the fact that if you, if something fails, it's it's immediately catastrophic up there, right? Uh, and so, um, when you look at our planet and you realize how perfectly it works to to keep, you know, all nine billion of us alive, it's it's pretty incredible. And so it really gives you an appreciation to say, hey, not only do we need to take care of it, but we need to take care of it in a way that ensures that our kids and our grandkids are going to have uh, a good future. Um, and you know, I. It, it's hard to say in words what, what being out on a sp spacewalk especially, but I will say uh, being on space station is, is incredible. When you go outside for a spacewalk, um, it is a hundredfold better uh, as far as the view and how you really feel uh, that you're in space because there's just nothing between you except you know, your, a little bit of glass and your spacesuit. Um, I've been lucky enough to climb some mountains. Hopefully, if you guys have climbed some mountains, when you go to you know a 14,000 foot or, or higher peak, and you look out, uh, and, and all you can uh, feel is awe, and then you try to take a picture with your phone, right? And then you look at the picture, and it just never it, it never comes close. Uh, and so, as much as I can try to describe it, that's uh, imagine that a thousandfold when you're trying to describe what space is like. Um, but it, it's. It honestly feels surreal. I, I, now that I'm back and I'm here, I, I almost have to pinch myself because I, I remember it vividly. It's not like it's um, fading, but it's just such a stark difference that you really almost feel like you have to pinch yourself uh, to, to remember, like, oh my gosh, we really were up there and, and all that did happen. And yeah, well, um, no, it's just, it's just such a difference. Uh, you know, it's not a dream. Again, it was a, it was a very real experience. Um, but it's just so different that it's, it's almost impossible to explain. We have a question from Leo on X who asks, is eating food at the space station just as bad as it was in the early moon landing days or early space station days? Yeah, you know, well, I, I don't know, right? I wasn't there uh, in the early days, but um, the food's not bad. I mean, now, again, I've, I've deployed many times and I'm an army guy, so I'm, uh, I'm used to MREs and uh, food that's, you know, you get what you need in a in a in a uh, challenging environment. And so, um, honestly, food for me uh, was great, and it was a morale booster. Um, now, th there's days where you go, it, it just gets monotonous because there's a lot of variety, but there's only so much variety, right? And so, um, at least a couple times a week, you're eating the same thing over and over. And so, especially for a 12-month mission, uh, that can get repetitive. Uh, but it makes it that much more special when the resupply ships come up and you get fresh food or you get something special from your family or your friends. Um, and you know, it, it really can just makes your week when you're able to eat something uh, unique. Okay. 
¿Qué me podría decir es lo más desafiante para un ser humano en el espacio por un tiempo tan prolongado como más de un año que pasaron? También, ¿qué me diría marcó su vida, algo que no va a olvidar en la estación espacial? Y ya por último, siente que el haber estado por más de un año realmente tendrá un impacto y ¿cuál sería en las investigaciones que está haciendo la NASA? Bueno, eh, para mí lo más importante fue eh, mi fe y la, y la fe de mi, mi familia, ¿no? porque nos, nos uh, sostenió y nos dio una fuerza que no creo que pudiera uh, ser uh, nuestra sin, sin, sin nuestra fe. Eh, yo creo que cada vez que un humano eh, hace algo por la primera vez, uh, y claro, para, para mí solo es uh, nuestro país, ¿no? es la primera vez que cruzamos ese, esta marca de un año, eh, creo que es, es muy importante y, y cada pedazo de, uh, de data que tomamos es importante, ¿no? porque necesitamos preparar para estar más lejos en la luna, o sea, hoy martes, eh, cada pedazo de información que tenemos creo que va a ser muy importante para esas misiones. Um, disculpa, ¿cuál, ¿cuál fue la última parte? Había preguntado sobre eh, qué es lo más desafiante para el ser humano estando por un tiempo tan prolongado en el espacio y qué fue lo que más lo marcó estando ahí. Ya, yeah, eh, bueno, eh, para mí lo que más me marcó es eh, mi, mis compañeros, mis amigos, eh, Pude volar con 28 otras personas eh, y, claro, cuando solo han uh, menos de 700 personas que han estado en el espacio, eh, 28 personas son casi 5% de, de los humanos que hemos estado en el, en el espacio. Entonces, para mí fue algo increíblemente eh, especial y algo que siempre voy a acordarme, no solo de que estuve en el espacio, pero la gente con la cual estuve eh, durante esta misión. Okay, Will, age nine, from the UK, would like to know whether you felt happy while you were in space, and would you recommend being an astronaut? <laughs> hey, well, you know, I think this is the best job in the world, absolutely. Uh, again, you have to be comfortable with uh, uncertainty. Uh, you have to be comfortable with uh, some difficult and challenging environments. Um, but if you are, and you're curious, and uh, you like to study, because that is one thing I think that's undersold, is how much uh, study time and preparation takes Uh, to get to this point, uh, absolutely, I would recommend it. Um, and again, despite the challenges, I count myself incredibly blessed because, heck yeah, launching in a rocket, uh, being in space, doing spacewalks, doing hard things really is kind of fun. And you feel a certain gratification that you just don't feel um, on a regular day-to-day -day, um, activity. So uh, doing all those things was absolutely one of the most gratifying things uh, I've ever had in my life. Um, And yeah, I would say it was a lot of fun. Okay. Sophie, Sophie Sanchez with Cosmic Chicago again. Um, since we're on the topic of food, maybe you didn't eat the tomato, <laughs> but I know you probably ate a lot of tortillas in space because they're a staple in space station like they're in my home. Um, a lot of folks don't realize how much space tech um, has gone or food tech has gone into um, making tortillas shelf stable for space and that's trickled down to the tortillas we buy um, for ourselves. So I'm going to put you on the spot. Gr your mother's tortillas or space tortillas? Which <laughs> did you prefer? And um, what was your favorite meal to have on a tortilla? Yeah, so uh, thanks, Sophie. And you're right. So for those that don't know, um, bread, unfortunately, uh, the crumbs that come with, with bread uh, aren't great uh, on Space Station. And so we, we default to tortillas as our form of bread uh, because th they're not as crummy. Uh, and so, um, yeah, every day, uh, most people have at least one. Uh, honestly, I started off eating probably one or two every couple days, and then I really cut back just because um, it got a little bit monotonous uh, after a couple months. And so um, on station, we, we mostly have flour tortillas, and in El Salvador, which is really the, you know, when you say my mom's tortillas, they're more corn tortillas, and so they're completely different. Uh, and so I would, I would have to say my mom's tortillas are definitely uh, better. But honestly, um, by the end, I was probably having one every couple weeks. It wasn't, it wasn't that common for me to have them. And it was it's just kind of an empty calorie, right? And um, again, for me. Uh, and I think the shorter amount of uh, mission, the less you have to worry about. The longer you're up there, the more you kind of start thinking about your health and, and kind of choices that you're making and 
Um, and for me, it was really important to try to stay as healthy as possible because I wanted to return uh, really as high a function as I could so that I could be with my wife and kids as soon as possible, right? Because you can spend several weeks debilitated if, you don't, uh, if you're not careful about taking care of yourself. And so I really tried to invest a lot of effort into that. Okay, we'll take another question from our phone bridge from Andrea with the Houston Chronicle. Hi, I, I hope this one comes through a little better. I'm curious, other than seeing your family, what's the first thing you did in Houston and what's the first thing you ate upon getting back home? Thanks. His oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, um, gosh, that is a great question. Uh, you know, Andrea, I, I um, well, I, I went home uh, and, um, you know, it's essentially, you come back, you fly. We landed in Kazakhstan, and then within 24 hours, you're back in Houston. Um, so really, the first thing I did, unfortunately, is not very exciting because you, you actually go directly to the lab, and they draw blood work, and they start doing the science studies right away. Uh, and so you're, you're somewhat um, going straight into science mode uh, for the first few hours. And so then after that's over, then you get to kind of relax and um, spend some time with loved ones. And um, you know, my, my two kids from college had, uh, were able to come back and uh, spend time with us. And so really, we went home and uh, we cooked a meal together as a family. And, and that was just a, a lot of fun because, uh, especially for my wife, she'd been without half of our family for a year. And so I had to have all six of us back together in the kitchen and just kind of uh, having fun and talking to each other and making fun of each other and uh, just enjoying our time together it was really a pretty magical moment. And, and um, you know, regardless of what we made, uh, which was a, a great meal, uh, I'll keep that <laughs> private, but it, uh, it, it really was just that, that family environment and the, the, I mean, so many families have experienced that time in the kitchen together, right, where you're just enjoying being with each other, so. Okay, go ahead. Francois Picard uh, from uh, AFP. I have two questions. First of all, um, what, do you think that the training was hard to reach uh, the job you, you've had, and was it harder than the job itself? And um, the second question is more about how you feel right now physically. Do you feel like you're 100% back? Yeah, no, uh, great questions, thank you. So, um, you know, it, it, that's a, a complex question because uh, there's several steps to that, right? It, one of the hardest things is actually just being selected as an astronaut uh, because it's incredibly selective. Um, and the reality is there's hundreds of incredibly qualified individuals, and NASA is just limited by numbers, right? You, you can only train so many people in any given class. And so generally, the last few classes, you've picked about 10 people every four years. And you know, again, we'd all be lying if we're like, we're the 10 best people in that four-year span. And so there's a little bit of luck of, of uh, hey, you're fortunate enough to be selected. Uh, of course, your resume kind of has to stand out uh, right to, to get to that point and then um, you have to do well in your interviews and so that part of it can be very challenging uh, and uh, for a lot of people it's a lot of you know you can be incredibly well qualified you can be a perfect candidate but the stress of the situation and the stress of the fact that hey I'm, I'm, I'm in this incredibly selective process for some people uh, that's too much um, but assuming you get to that point um, then you start in this really fun training right you're, you're doing a lot of really uh, cool things. You're, you're flying in the T-38 jet. You're learning to do spacewalks in the NBL. Uh, you're learning a new language, uh, Russian, for us. Uh, you're learning all this space station systems. And, and from an engineering perspective, that, that station is a, is a marvel. Right? I mean, it's a, it's a small Earth floating around space as far as like keeping humans alive. You have to have a small Earth environment up there. So learning all of that and the engineering that went into it uh, and the appreciation that you get for the people who came up with the the design is, is pretty incredible. Um, and then you're exposed to a little bit of uh, the aeronautical engineering that, that has to go into space flight uh, as you prepare for that. So for me, that, that's all fun. Again, there's a lot of book studying that comes with that. And so if you're not into, into that, uh, it could, it could uh, fun would not be the way to describe it. Uh, but I've always just enjoyed learning new things. So, um, and you know, I think, uh, so EVA is probably the most challenging thing we do up there, the spacewalks, um, extravehicular activities. Um, and the training in the NBL physically is actually a little bit more challenging because you have the resistance of the water, right? The only way to really achieve that neutral buoyancy is underwater uh, here on Earth. 
And so uh, every time you're moving that 300 pound spacesuit uh, through the water, you're, you're, you're pushing a lot of pressure. And so it is physically very challenging. Um, but uh, in space, the fact that you're going out into vacuum and you only have your own personal little space vehicle, uh, even though physically it's a little less challenging, uh, emotionally and mentally, it's much more fatiguing because you feel like you have to have perfect execution that one day, uh, right? And you've had years and years of training and it kind of goes all into this one event that hundreds of people are supporting and two of you are going out there and uh, trying to get this thing done. Again, I was fortunate enough to do three of them and um, it, it's humbling in a lot of ways. Mo the, the biggest way is, is you appreciate how much time and effort so many people, hundreds of people put into making this 10 or 12 hour event happen uh, and how incredibly well choreographed it is. So um, I'd say no, day of was definitely more challenging, but it's really the cumulative effect. Physically, it's less challenging. Uh, the cumulative effect of what you're doing, I think, is more challenging on day of. Oh, yeah, I feel great. Uh, no, I'm not, I don't think I'm back to 100%. Uh, I, I'd say probably 80 to 90%, which I think is actually pretty good. Um, but like the bottoms of my feet are still sore from just standing and walking. Um, again, my lower back's still a little bit sore, uh, right? So that's, those things are not fully resolved yet. Uh, so I, I, I can't say that I'm 100%, but I am 100% as far as vertigo goes. When I'm driving, there's no sort of uh, disorientation. Everything feels perfectly normal. Um, I've been able to jog and it feels fine. Um, so yeah, it, it depends on what you're asking. So not 100% yet, but I, I think functionally, I, I feel 100%. Okay, our next question comes from the phone bridge from David Curley with Discovery Channel. Hey, Frank, welcome back. Um, looking forward to hearing about those non-kumbaya issues down the road. But you've touched on a couple things, and I'd like to ask a broader question. Uh, when you were still on station before departure, you were asked, uh, would you have accepted a one-year mission? And for personal reasons, you said no. Well, broader, broadly, what does that say? How long do you think an astronaut can spend in space? What does it mean for going to Mars? And also, as a flight surgeon, did you end up finding yourself studying yourself? Thank you. Hey, David. Uh, yeah, no, it's great to, uh, great to hear from you. And um, so first, the, there wasn't really that much drama, right? But anytime you put more than one human together for an extended period of time, there's going to be issues that you have to work through. So uh, there's no, uh, no hidden message there. It's just any, any team requires, uh, if you're going to be a team that improves, you have to work through some issues. Um, but um, yeah, so, you know, it's, uh, um, gosh, it's really a, a tough question to answer as far as how long can you stay up there? Because, you know, the thing that was drawing me back home was family and, and missing family. Uh, but on the flip side of that is the thing that grounded me the most and allowed me to perform was family, right? And just having that foundation and that, that love and that support, I think, allowed me to actually do a better job for the time that I was there. So um, I think it'd be um, false to say, oh, you know, I needed to come home because of my family, but, uh, or I could have stayed longer without my family, because I, th I think that's actually absolutely wrong for me. Uh, I don't know that I would have done as well as I did without that, without that support structure and that, that love that, that's kind of keeping me up there. Um, it's a very personal question, to be honest. I think it's going to be very different, right? Uh, um, you know, there's people that you, if you say, hey, we can send you to Mars, but there's not a great chance that we can bring you back. Uh, I think there's a lot of people that would be like, yeah, send me. I, I'm just not, you know, I, I'm absolutely willing to take risks, but I'm, I'm not willing to take um, silly risk, right? And, I, and really, this kind of mission requires uh, good analysis and good mitigation. And you don't want to just go willy-nilly into something risky without having a good plan. And so. Uh, I'm kind of glad that we have the approach of like, hey, we want a 100% success, right? Now, we realize that you're always going to have to be flexible. You're, it's, you know, the 100% plan goes right out the door as soon as you uh, hit the start button on the rocket. Uh, but um, I, I think as much as possible, we will hopefully always approach these missions with the uh, thought process of not only are we going to uh, want success, but we uh, want a high level of success that makes sure that we can repeat these missions to maintain a presence first on the moon and then eventually on Mars. Okay, it looks like we have one more question from Jackie with the Times of London. Hello again, thanks for the second hit. 
There were lots of headlines while you were up there um, about you being stranded. Um, we know you weren't exactly, but you were sort of still an accidental record setter. And the length of time that you spent on orbit was unexpected. Did you ever actually feel that kind of vulnerability that being stranded uh, would have presented? And also, um, given the extension of your mission, did you get to ask for more stuff to be sent up? If so, what? And I apologize for this next part of the question, but my kids will want to know, how do you make six months of underwear last for a year? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, Jackie, that's a, those are great questions. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, I, I don't know that I ever felt um, stranded is the wrong word. I mean, but ultimately, you are in space. It's not like you can just walk out the door and come back to Earth whenever you want. Um, so there's definitely limitations. Uh, to transportation, but that's that's the case of whether you're up there for uh, a week or you're up there for a year, right? Like you're just limited by the fact that you have to have a spacecraft to get up there and get back. Um, so no, I never felt stranded. I never felt alone. But I did fully appreciate the fact that um, you know I, I, I couldn't come home whenever I wanted, uh, and that's that's okay. Again, that's part of the mission. Um, so yes, as soon as uh, we knew that the possibility of me staying an extra six months. Uh, again, this incredible support team that we have, uh, the wheels started turning and they actually send stuff, even if, you're, even if the decision isn't made, uh, to be able to support the fact that you might be extended, right? And uh, fully appreciating that you might lose uh, precious cargo space in that spacecraft, uh, the team tries to make sure that you are uh, both comfortable and taken care of in case it actually uh, happens. And so for me, uh, again, it, it worked out great in the sense of I, I never felt like I was without um, things that I needed. Now, certainly, again, you're, you're in space, right? So you're not going to have everything you want, uh, but you'd be surprised how little you actually need uh, to function uh, every day. Uh, so unfortunately, we don't have a way to wash clothes in space. So generally, what you do is you send um, a resupply of whatever uh, clothing allotment you're given. Uh, there, it depends on uh, what kind of clothing you're talking about. So you're your fitness uh, clothing, the stuff that you work out in every day, you obviously change that out uh, a little more often than the clothes you wear to work. Because when you're working, uh, you're not really sweating uh, all that much. And so you'll wear those clothes for a little bit longer than your workout clothes. And then you just have enough of those uh, to last you for the uh, duration of your mission. Um, again, uh, the reality of space is when you're done with that, all that stuff goes in the trash. And the resupply vehicles that come up uh, that that don't have a, a heat shield capability, we empty those out of all the supplies and then we fill, up, fill them back up with trash. And then um, when they deorbit, all of that burns up in the atmosphere. Uh, and that's, again, unfortunately, the, the reality of kind of the environment that we're in. Um, but we do try to wear those uh, clothes and use the things as, as long as possible to maximize um, both the efficiency and um, you know, to, to just make the best use of our resources. All right, well, that's all the time we have for our press conference today. Frank, thanks again so much for joining us. And thank you to all of you for joining in through our various platforms today. We'll see you next time. All right, thanks, everybody.